That was before the Don't princess get line. brazen with me. Courtroom often marked the downfall of corrupt officers who believe they can act without accountability. Today, we'll explore cases where these officers were exposed and humbled in court. Stick around till the end. The last cop's action will leave you speechless. Our first case is about the evil cop, Michael Amiot, who punched and kicked a person after pulling him over for a traffic stop. It didn't take long for the jury to reach its verdict. We, the jury being duly impaneled and sworn, do hereby find the defendant, Michael Amiot, guilty of assault, a misdemeanor of the first degree, in violation of section 2903.13a of the Ohio Revised Code as charged in count two. We do so render our verdict this 29th day of July. Do hereby find the defendant, Michael Amiot, guilty of interfering with civil rights, a misdemeanor of the first degree, in violation of section 2921.45a of the Ohio Revised Code as charged in count three. We do so render our verdict this 29th day of July, 2022. The corrupt cop was found guilty on both counts. He sat there in silence, keeping a straight face and clearly showed no remorse for his actions. That is your decision as to whether you wish to speak with him. With that, anything prior to discharging the jury? No, Your Honor. On behalf of the defendant, anything? Yes. Well, that wasn't the end of the trial, as the very next day, Amiot was called to sentencing. The victim was present and allowed to share a statement before the sentence was handed down. I appreciate the, uh, the jury and the court for making the right decision. You know, what Amiot did to me was wrong. He should have received the maximum sentences today. You know, I'm still going through like the suffering with the anxiety, you know, driving, just as, the temperament, the trauma, and everything. This is a cause for this, for this case. I'm, I'm ready to get it over it actually, but just coming back in here just like bring up everything, you know, and just to see him over there, you know, see all that, just coming back in this court, just like it's, it just brings up everything like we live at the moment. So, you know, I hope you get the maximum sentences today, you know? after, Amiot was allowed to address the court, and he delivered a lengthy statement. One of the most shocking examples was a prosecution witness called who testified that I was celebrating in the aftermath of this arrest. He testified that I was high-fiving, fist-bumping, and dapping it up with other officers. There was five police cars on East 228th Street that day, all with their dash cameras on and rolling. They all had overlapping fields of view. I can be seen in front of one of those cameras the entire time I was on scene until I was transported to the hospital. Nothing remotely close to what the witness described happened with me or any other officer on the scene. They knew this and put the witness on the stand anyway. The officer continued to offer explanations and an attempt to clear his conscience. Eventually, he took some accountability, but only to a minimal extent. I take full responsibility that there was a failure on my behalf get Mr. Hubbard in custody quickly. The incident was prolonged and I was shot with a taser. During the deployment, I broke my hand, ruptured tendons, and injured my shoulder. I want to end by saying I'm not an advocate for or against use of force. Everything I did on that day was based on my training and experience. From here on out, I'll be an advocate for subject control training department-wide going forward so we can all be at our best when the time comes. I have a deep respect and love for the citizens and this community. I want to do my best to serve them. Before announcing the sentence, the judge expressed his disdain for Amiot's action, aiming to make the officer feel the weight of his wrongdoing. One, one of the things that uh, stood out to me is that uh, the initiation of this incident probably never should have occurred when you receive that initial radio communication. That initiated this whole thing. 
And the other thing that sort of stood out to me was that in approaching the vehicle and asking Mr. Hubbard to get out of the vehicle, there was an inability for him to get out of that vehicle without making contact with you. It is disheartening that Amiot never apologized to the victim, and the judge's personal comments must have been especially hard for him to hear. I believe the jury got it right. I do. Uh, and the court must impose the sentence that the court feels is appropriate in a case like this. And I appreciate uh, uh, the city of Euclid uh, compensated you. Uh, if you need assistance, you need to go and get that assistance. But uh, I'm not going to say you're not going to have uh, instances of flashback or what have you, but you need to uh, move on with your life also. Oh, yeah, yes, for sure. And not uh, let this incident uh, continue to hover over you. The city compensated you judge also tried to tell the victim to get back to life and move on from this terrible incident. Finally, the sentence was announced for the tyrant cop. The court at this time will impose a sentence of uh, 90 days, uh, require you to pay a fine of $1,000, and will require you to pay the court costs. In addition, the court will suspend the sentence of 90 days, uh, place you on non-reporting community control for a period of one year. Uh, if you violate during that one year, then the court will retain the ability to impose the sentence. Anything on behalf of the state? No, Your Honor. On behalf of Ms. Daniel. Just what um, count did this assist for electing the sentence? What count as opposed to the violation of civil rights? Not saying they weren't violated, but given the length of time, uh, the court will use the assault charge. Anything else? Judge Guy Reese sentenced Amiot to 90 days in prison and also fired him from the police force to ensure that such barbaric behavior would never happen again. While this judge was quite relaxed, this next one took this attorney to the cleaners. And the court left the door open. This for me, not for you. That was before the Don't defense Don't get testimony. brazen with me. During the Kyle Rittenhouse homicide case, Assistant District Attorney Thomas Binger ignored the judge's previous rulings and continued questioning the banned topic. This led to a furious defense attorney and an even angrier judge. Uh, I'm going to ask you to go into the library uh, again for a moment, please. Please don't talk about the case. He's either forgetting the court's rulings or attempting to provoke a mistrial in this matter. He knows he can't go into this and he's asking the questions. I ask the court to strongly admonish him, and the next time it happens, I'll be asking for a mistrial with prejudice. He's an expert. First of all, Your Honor, this was the subject of a motion. I'm well aware of that. And the court left the door open. This for me, not for you. It was clear that Judge Schroeder was extremely angry at the prosecutor as he dismissed the jury for a while to hold him accountable. My understanding of you your... should have come and asked for uh, for reconsideration. You did on the one motion, and in fact, I granted your motion for reconsideration. That was not a motion. I, why would you think that that made it okay for you, without any advance notice, to bring this matter before the jury? You are already. You were. I, I was a, astonished when you began your examination by commenting on the defendant's post-arrest silence. That's basic law. It's been basic law in this country for 40 years, 50 years. 
I have no idea why you would do something like that. And it gives, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll leave it at that. So I don't know what you're up to. The prosecutor had made a huge mistake, and things were about to get from bad to worse for the poor guy. He was using it in a manner to try and protect property. No, he wasn't. There's, Your Honor, I, with all due respect... I'm not going to rehash the motion. Yeah, that's absolutely untrue. It and is there's... No, no, no. Your arguments of record... My comments are of record, and why I ruled as I did is of record. There's nothing that I heard in this trial to suggest that anything's changed. Even if you're correct in your assumption that you know more than uh, I did at the time, uh, why you would think that you could go into it without any advance notice to the court, I don't understand that. And as the uh, defense is pointing out, you're an experienced trial lawyer, and this should not have been gone into. The defense panel was growing restless, unable to believe what they were hearing. Binger's excuses were weak, and he was about to be called out for them. The defendant has just testified this morning that he agreed with that person in the yellow pants, that he pointed the gun at him. He said, I was joking when I said that to the guy in the yellow pants, but he said, he's acknowledged that he told the person in the yellow pants, yeah, you're right, I did point a gun at you when you were sitting on a car. He said, I did. That's what he exactly. testified. You know, there's a lot of difference between commenting about something when you haven't got a gun and threatening someone when you do. You know, it's interesting, Your Honor, because the entire defense theory in this case is Joseph Rosenbaum, who was unarmed. I want you to tell me what the defense theory of the case is. I want... May I, look, res may I respond look. to what you just said, Your Honor? I'd like to respond to what you Can just you said. Down, I, I apologize, Madam Court Reporter, but I'd like to try and make a record without... It's rare to see attorneys speak to police officers in this manner. And if Binger continues this behavior, he could be held in contempt of court. On his beliefs and on his statements. I'm going to interrupt you now because you're talking about his beliefs. I think that's what they call his statements to your honor. Because he just said, can't use deadly force, can't threaten to use deadly force to protect property. So now I'm impeaching him on that. Your honor, what's the, the court has seen no reason to change its ruling. And just so this record is clear, in spite of the lengthy statement by Mr. Binger, before we started today, the court specifically stated in Mr. Binger's presence, there's been nothing to have me change any of my rulings. He knows if you're going to go into something that's been excluded in a pretrial order, you better ask the court, you better get permission. This is ridiculous. It, you was, know, it wasn't excluded, Your Honor. You know why it was excluded in the first place? Because it's, it was propensity evidence. The judge taught him a lesson about who the boss was. And just when he tried to talk over him, he delivered one final blow. His attitude is he wants to shoot people. Now, I've admitted that kind of evidence in other trials when it's been appropriate. I didn't admit it in this case because, to me, what I've heard in this trial, and by the way, Mr. Richards absolutely correctly points out that just hours ago, I said I had heard nothing in this trial to change any of my rulings. That was before so the why? Testimony, Your Honor. Pardon me. That was before the testimony. Don't get testimony. brazen with me. Uh, uh, you knew very well. You know very well that an attorney can't go into these types of areas when the judge has already ruled without asking outside the presence of the jury to do so. So don't give me that. That's number one. We more on evidence. Judge Weinstein, Colonel McCormick. It's the, the prior act has to bear the signature of the accused, or it has to be so similar as to suggest it's a common plan or something like that. The judge delivered a brief speech to instill discipline in his courtroom before calling the jury back. When, when you were way, well, I said you were over the line in that, uh, close to or over the line on commenting on the defendant's pretrial silence, which is a well-known rule, that that would have been an issue. So I don't want to have another issue as long as this case continues. Is that clear? It is. Thank you. I ask the jury to come back in, please. <clears throat> this was surely humiliating for the attorney, and he'll forever think that he should never have broken the rules. Coming back to police officers, here is another instance when a corrupt bully was questioned and owned. Did you apprehend good guys? Dead before. Never. I take that back. I bit a victim one time because she jumped in front of me. Daytona Beach police officer Joshua Mesereau 
was involved in a gun battle with Marvin Jones, who was shot five times. Jones also had his girlfriend with him, Aviana Bailey, who the officer also shot. The young mother-to-be was left paralyzed from the chest down after the incident. Following this life-altering event, she filed a lawsuit against the police and the city. Playing, fumbling, doing something with in his lap. There's none of this, there's none of this, it's, it's, it's this. And he's looking at me the whole time. And then it happens. What happened? He sticks the gun out the window and points it at me. Okay, how does he stick the gun out the window? Uh, if I'm sitting in the driver's seat, where would my... So he, would, he just went just like that. Okay. And it was between the mirror and the A-post. Okay. Well, actually, if I'm driving... Exactly. I'm sorry. If I'm driving, the driver's side, is, the door is here. So he did this. Okay. Because you had him moving. Excuse me. Further into the no. passenger compartment. No, that was completely. Right. That was my. That was my mix-up in the, in the side. It was the right side that he did get it with, and then he put the gun between the. The window. Officer Joshua couldn't even get the story straight, and you'll be shocked to see how casually he took the deposition. You said right side again. Left side. I'm dyslexic. Are you are you dyslexic? No, no, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't that was a bad joke. Have, do you recall how many rounds? Just one at that time. Okay. And where did it strike? The hood and windshield area, right in front of him. And how many muzzle flashes did you see in total at scene two? At least the initial, at least one. And possibly two. I I, I can't I can't count him. I can't tell you how many exactly I saw. The officer's demeanor clearly showed his ego as he was taking everything just a little too lightly. It was clear he had no understanding how drastically Bailey's life had been altered. She could no longer even care for her baby. I was committed to engaging him. And I, and I, I did that, at which point I, my ankle rolled off the curb and I fell on my back. Okay. I was falling and still shooting so somehow the the gun jammed from limp wristing it okay um that were fired at you or you saw several muzzle flashes yes okay. how do you define several objective one one or two two probably okay several's not one yeah what we agree to that do you mean is several more than two objective I would say two, so we'll say a couple. Okay. Investigators pressed Joshua about the tragic incident, but he continued to make light of this serious situation, attempting to joke instead of addressing it responsibly. In your deposition, you discussed dust. Um, tell me about that. Four. Was there dust at scene two? Yes. Tell me about that. Four. There was dust at scene two. <laughs> uh, and, and I understand there may have been dust on the ground, but did the dust become airborne? Yes, from from the suspect's vehicle spinning in the grass, which was dry. Did the dust was did the dust settle? Let me say, um, before you got out of your car? No. Okay, so there was still some dust in the air. Correct. When did the dust settle? Still hasn't settled. Um, it, I guess it never really did. I mean, uh, that I remember. Okay. Now, before you got out of your car and engaged Marvin Jones, did you know anything about him or his background? Just the fact that he might have some felony warrants out of New Hampshire. How did you learn that? Uh, apparently, somebody called from New Hampshire to rat him out. Joshua had no remorse for his action, and as the deposition continued, his answers were about to get even more weird. What threat was posed to the safety of an officer or other person at the point you first got out of your car? There was none. Okay. What threat to an officer or other was posed when you first drew your firearm? 
There was none. What threat to an officer or other was posed when you got out of your car, when you, when you took a step towards the Lincoln? Objective one. The, at this point, the defendant's actions. Okay. Which were what? Fumbling around on his, making very furtive movements. Okay. Kept looking at me. The attorney then questioned Joshua about his troubled past, which included being removed from his role as a canine officer. When pressed on this matter, his cocky and dismissive responses were shocking. Did you have your duties as a canine handler revoked or rescinded at any point? Yes, I did. What happened? Or why? Um, Form of objection. In my opinion, yes. I was doing my job too well. What does that mean? It means I was beating the streets and I was catching bad guys. Okay. There, there wasn't a lot of bad guys that got away from me. Because your dog got him? Because we got him as a team. Okay. And if, if you have a, a, an above average bite ratio, that means you could be using your dog too much. Okay. A bite ratio is how many people you apprehend and then how many people you dog bite during that apprehension. So they're saying 30%. So they're saying out of 10 people that you apprehend, you should bite three of them, let's say. Okay. Which never made any sense to me. The officer was so arrogant that he had no clue that he was appearing stupid. His desperate attempt to portray himself in a positive light only highlighted his dangerous and bullying nature. When was your canine handler response of duties taken away? Late 2011. As a matter of fact, December 23rd, 2011. Okay. Why does that date stick out? Worst day of my life. I, I enjoyed the job. You, I would have paid the city to come do that job. Tracking down bad guys and, and, and finding them and, and apprehending them. Did you apprehend good guys? Dick. I take that back. I bit a victim one time because she jumped in front of me. So I did. I bit a victim one time. She was that another officer? No, it was a, vi a victim, a domestic violence victim. Joshua's history was riddled with poor decisions and excessive use of force. The attorney dug deeper, exposing his psychopathic nature. Do you need supervisor, supervisor authority to conduct a strip search? Yes, sir. Did you obtain supervisor authority before you, you searched Justin Riddle? No, sir. Did you receive counseling or, or um, did a supervisor talk to you about that and tell you you, you did that portion incorrectly? Yes, sir. Okay. March 2011, there was a newspaper article about a, a lawyer that claimed you use Excessive force, do you recall that incident? Yes, sir. Tell me about that. He was, yeah, Roe, he was hammered. He was drunk. Oh yeah, I remember this one. This is, this is the one where you were alleged to have gone in a home without permission, like moved somebody's arm. Do you recall that mm -hmm. incident? What happened there? I was on K-9. We were looking for their twins two of them. I forget their names, but he, we saw one on the bed through the window. And I'm like, that's him. That's him. But this is before I knew he had a twin or, or a brother. So he had a felony warrant. The uh, twin did? The, no. The one of them. The one of them had a felony warrant. The guilty one, not the yes. innocent one. So the mother's there and got the place surrounded. And basically she said, you're not coming in. Well, he's in there. We can see him in there. We can force entry on a felony warrant if we see the person and we confirm it's him. I eat that one. That was my responsibility all day long for knowing, not knowing that it was it's the, that it's the brother. Um, but they do look different. If I had seen his face, maybe pay attention more, pay attention to his haircut. Did you ever arrest a good guy? Or did I ever arrest a good guy? Yeah. Not that I can recall. So. Eventually, the tyrant cop was saved by qualified immunity. 
but poor Bailey did receive some settlement money from the city. Now that won't be solving her problems, but it might give her something to cheer about. And that brings us to the end of this video. Today we witnessed corrupt cops being held accountable in court and some shocking courtroom moments. It is astounding how these officers act as if they are above the law, causing irreparable harm to innocent lives. However, these cases serve as a wake-up call for others in law enforcement to reflect, reform, and uphold their duty with integrity. If you agree with me, please support us by liking this video. Also, if you enjoyed this video, watch some more of these satisfying moments when officers were humbled in courtrooms. Then I want you taking him up on perjury. Your Honor. Will you take him up for he perjury? He admitted it was a mistake, Your Honor. No, but he lied. He lied on a sworn Absolutely citation. Absolutely not, Your Honor. 